Okay, I'm going to use the mic. Right, and we are recording this because we felt like this was an important program that we were doing here, and so we wanted to be able to use it elsewhere. So if you could also both use the mics, now that I've modeled how we do it. Um, okay, so we're talking about Ukraine today, which is not anywhere near as happy as the tone I'm using right now, right? This has been a year of war. And we have two people who are, have expertise and experience and lots of people they love who are there. Um, and they are going to share with us today. Cantor Hirshhorn is going to sing. Um, and um, Professor David Fishman is going to talk about his recent experiences there, why the heck this should matter, especially to people who are students of modern Jewish history, leaders of modern Jewish history, cantors, rabbis, educators. Um, so this is a chance to be together. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and you might also be thinking about other things happening. And you should feel welcome to bring your questions. We don't assume that you know any particular thing, but this is a chance to be together and learn both facts and feelings. Um, so thank you to both of you. So first of all, good morning, good afternoon. If you're still chewing, please continue this very important process. But um, if you'd like to sing, we're gonna we're gonna get started with singing. So this beautiful nigun uh, is actually in a little handout that is on your um, table. Uh, it is from the collection of Moise or Moshe Berigovsky um, and was collected in Ukraine some hundred plus years ago uh, and then was made available to uh, the rest of the humanity through the efforts of this incredible Soviet ethnomusicologist, Moisey Birigovsky. I'm not going to tell you so much about him, but um, I gave you a little bit of a taste of what it was like to be um, an ethnomusicologist starting, studying Jewish music in Ukraine. You can see some really interesting quotes, One praise, some praising him. Um, some accusing him of all kinds of terrible things. Um, but uh, I can tell you that growing up in Ukraine, I was born in Ukraine and I came back to uh, study in conservatory in Kiev 
and I left in 1992 because I firmly believe at that point that for somebody who wants to study Jewish music, there was no future in Ukraine. At that point, that's, that was my experience for the first 20 years of my life. And I thought, okay, this is it. I have to, I have to go somewhere else. And if I want to study Jewish music, this is not going to be happening there. Uh, when I went, for instance, to Vernatsky Library, I discovered uh, uh, this is like a main, main science and arts and whatever, everything, everything library in Kiev. And I wanted to get some resources on Jewish music. That was in around 1990. Um, I was like, and what is your name? And what is your address? All the things that I shouldn't have to give as somebody who just wants to peruse materials in the, um, um, in the reading hall and so on. So what I'm sharing with you um, is just to give you a little taste um, of how things were then and uh, what my dear friend and um, wonderful professor David Fishman is going to speak about is largely about what happened after I left in Ukraine the last 30 years and how the country turned around uh, in so many ways, including how it uh, now deals with its Jews and how the interactions are happening. And um, whether I, for, for me or for, for uh, Professor Fishman, this is... Um, this is a difficult anniversary to mark because uh, just as I was shocked a year ago that this war had begun, I had since been in touch with my people. I grew up with my friends, some family members, um, classmates, teachers, and um, my heart breaks for what's happening there right now. I wanted to share with you this nigun, first of all, because it's really great, and second, because if you will go to communities and you want to share something related to Ukraine, this is an easy way to do it, is a wordless nigun, then people uh, may feel more connected to the place and its people through music. So without further ado, I'm going to give this um, mic over to Professor Fishman. And now I'll turn it over to Aiden. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Some of you are familiar from classes. Many of you are not, but you're familiar from the hallway. Um, thanks for coming. And thanks for letting Natasha and me share our, I hope I'll be able to share not only knowledge, but our feelings, because um, it's been a very emotional year for people like me and Natasha. Um, I just want to really talk about the war and about the Jewish aspects of the war and about my recent visit to Ukraine in the middle of January. Um, I'll just um, <clears throat> jump in. I teach modern Jewish history. My specialty is Jews in Eastern Europe. So I've been visiting Ukraine for the last uh, um, 30 years and especially intensely the last... Um, decade or so. I run a project for JTS, the Jewish Archival Survey, which publishes information on all the material in the archives on Jewish history in Ukraine. The project works city by city. So I spent much time visiting Kiev when we were working on Kiev and on Lviv when we were working on Lviv. And so <clears throat> that's the reason, the formal reason why I've been going to Ukraine so much the last um, decade. Okay, let me jump in. If you can see, these, these screens are far away, but the green is Ukraine, or a better map. This is more detailed. Uh, it's a big country. Um, it's, one of, it's the biggest country in Europe, if you leave aside Russia, um, bigger than France uh, in space. Population, 40 million. Um, Lots of borders. Um, <clears throat> yes, Russia on one side, Poland on another. Of course, there's a lot of Jewish history here, and I'm not going to speak about it, but, um, but this was a big center of Jewish life. Before the Holocaust, there were about two and a half million people, Jews, 
in um, the territory of today's Ukraine. Associations, of course, the heartland of Hasidism, of all the basically classical Hasidic masters, um, the birthplace of Chaim Nachman Bialik, of um, uh, Agnon, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, great Hebrew writers of Shalom Aleichem. Um, okay, I will move uh, forward. I should say one thing about Ukraine in general, which would really help you understand. I know, like most people, I know how I followed the war in Iraq or in Afghanistan. It was all one big blur and one big, you know, terrible things after terrible things. Unfortunately, I can't follow Ukraine the way I followed Iraq and Afghanistan. I follow it much more closely. But one thing it's important to keep in mind. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oops. Um, is Ukrainians haven't had an independent state for almost all of their modern history. They were a stateless people in some ways similar to Jews. There was only an independent Ukraine, 1917 to 1921, and since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the last 31, 32 years. Other than that, overwhelmingly, Ukraine has been part of the Russian Empire, part of the Soviet Union, which was based in Moscow, really run out of Moscow. Parts of Ukraine belong to Poland, to other countries. So they're relatively new at having an independent state. And that would help you, all of us understand the fierceness with which they're fighting for their independence. They're not going to give up this um, major accomplishment in, in their history. I think we need to talk about this because I'm, I'm not that young. I really can't remember a war or an event, at least in my mind, I'll be honest with you, where it was such a clear choice between good and evil. Usually in a lot of conflicts in the world, there are different sides of the story, there are different narratives, there are different degrees of who's right. Um, I have never encountered in my lifetime a story where it's, um, it's so quite crystal clear. Um, before the war began, Vladimir Putin very crudely, simply said, I'm taking it because I'm stronger. He used a very, uh, you know, image of rape. He said, you know, quoting a very crude uh, um, song, he just says, okay. Dravitsa ni dravitsa, nadete terpet krasavitsa. You know, you like it or you don't like it, you'll just have to take it, sweetheart. Which is very, very brutal and crude. Then saying, I'm strong, you're weak, and this is going to happen. And that has been the underlying th an underlying theme of, of this war. I'll mention some of the highlights just to remind you. Right, A terrible massacre of civilians in the town of Bucha. It, wherever there's been Russian occupation, there's been atrocities. Um, it, several hundred civilians killed in this town of Bucha near Kiev. In the port city of Mariupol, hundreds of people hid in a theater, and they marked the territory so that planes could see from above children, children. Um, but the theater was shelled, and the hundreds of people who were hiding in the theater um, were killed. I should point out, the, the area of direct hostilities is the far east uh, of the country. Um, but there's been shelling of cities far from the front, like Kiev, which you can see is nowhere near the front anymore, but you can still send missiles from the Black Sea or from Russia and hit cities like Kiev. I visited in January Chernivtsi, which is in the far west of the country, the safest place to be in all of Ukraine. It's never been hit by missiles, and it's a place of refuge. Um, for a lot of uh, internally displaced people. Um, the war has also been brutal, not only towards Ukrainian civilians, but even towards the Russian soldiers uh, who have been forcibly inducted. They're now being used literally as cannon fodder. 
There are these human waves of just sent out soldiers without, you know, without any armored vehicles, and they're just, uh, they're being killed in the thousands. It's really uh, uh, <coughs> um, a, a, a terrible, terrible um, event in our times. Now of a Jewish dimension. There are two dimen Jewish dimensions. I'm going to mention them briefly. One is the president of Ukraine is Jewish. Ukraine is the only country in the world outside of Israel which has a Jewish head of state. Um, his members of his family perished in the Holocaust. Um, other members of his family uh, died fighting against the Nazis in the Red Army, his grandfather. Um, and uh, everybody in Ukraine knows he's Jewish. It's an extraordinary event that this country struggling is led by a Jew. Not only him, by the way, the Minister of Defense is of Jewish background and the head of the Chief of Staff of the Presidential Administration is of Jewish background. And it's quite extraordinary that this could happen in an East European uh, country. The other Jewish angle to this story is there is a size, there was, and still is, a rather sizable Jewish community in Ukraine um, with institutions like these chesed, which are basically Jewish senior citizens centers and social service centers. There are synagogues all over Ukraine, um, the Brodsky synagogue is the biggest synagogue in Kiev. Um, I wanted to show you a picture of the Masorti community that still exists in Kiev, though most of its members have fled to other places. Um, and my friend, the rabbi, Rabbi Ruven Stamov, um, most of its members are now either further west in Chernivtsi or, or in uh, Germany or in, uh, uh, or in Israel. But it ha um, I, my estimate is there were about 100,000 Jews in Ukraine before the war, probably about half have left. Um, men between the ages of 18 and 60 cannot leave the country. And so um, there are a good number of Jewish men who are there and, and also uh, fighting, as I'll point out. Um, so there, uh, I'm going to a little bit talk about these two aspects, Jewish aspects of the war, the Jewish president and the Jewish community. This Jewish president has created a big problem for the Russians because the Russian propaganda was that they are fighting Nazis. They are fighting a Nazi regime. Putin, from the beginning, said the Ukrainian regime is a Nazi regime. And they still says that. Um, they are Nazis. And, of course, having a Jewish president <laughs> doesn't jive with that. So they've come up with different ways of explaining that. The most, com most prominent was when the foreign minister said, basically said, when he said that Hitler is, was also Jewish, what he meant to say by that is you can have Jewish Nazis. Um, that Zelensky, the president, is a Jewish servant of Nazis. He's the equivalent of a capo. Or of a, and that's what he was trying to say, that uh, you have a Jew serving the Nazis. That's been one li line of Russian rhetoric. Um, the other line, which is not as well known and is not as widespread, I have to also say, is even much more extreme, which is saying this war exists because of the Jews. Um, it's the Jew who is fomenting this conflict between Russians and Ukrainians. Um, and that is very common in the very far right of the Russian spectrum. But it, those people who like war and like to fight and are militarist and xenophobic and, um, and anti-Semitic, they've created this I image that really Ukrainians and Russians are one people. But, there's a Jew, but the Jews want to kill as many goyim as possible. And that's why Zelensky, the Jew, is fomenting a war. Um, a soft version of that theory was expressed by the Russian Ministry of, Defense, of Foreign Affairs, the, 
the spokesperson for the, I'll read it because it's small. She said, the spokesperson, Maria Zakharova, Zelensky doesn't care about his own people. Only in public does he call himself a citizen of Ukraine. Only in public does he wear a vishivanka, the traditional Ukrainian shirt. Only in public does he perform certain ritual acts in cathedrals. In reality, he doesn't belong to the culture and spirituality of this country and of this people. We fully understand that based on the merciless criminal acts that he perpetrates. And I was, he, Zelensky's a Jew, he's not a Ukrainian. And that's why he can perform the, you know, perpetrate crimes. That's the other, so the problem of a Jewish president has brought up different versions of anti-Semitic rhetoric in Russian official uh, discourse. Okay, now the community. Well, I should start with saying, now because of this, Jews have a privileged place in Ukrainian society. Ukrainians want to show we are not Nazis. Not only is our president Jewish, not only is our Minister of Defense Jewish, but we, you know, they're very solicitous to the Jewish community. And they want to show, um, and they want to, and they actually do feel closer. Not only do they want to show, that's a propaganda thing, they do feel much closer to the Jewish community now. Um, so that's why I want to show you this picture of the uh, Rabbi Osman meeting the chief of staff of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, Gen uh, General Zaluzhny, and they met several times. There, um, and I met Ukrainians who have said to me, naively but still very sympathetically, have said to me, now I understand what the Holocaust must have been for you Jews. Of course, there's, they're incommensurate, but I'm not going to insult them on that moment and say, no, you don't. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, it's Zelensky who makes these comparisons. And for once, there is so much awareness of the Holocaust and of the horrors. Um, and there is this sympathy for Jews that now we understand better what you went through. And because Ukraine wants to join Europe and the West, it wants to show that it treats its minorities well. That's a criteria for joining Europe, is that you treat religious and ethnic and sexual and other minorities well, and they want to show that they're treating Jews well. Um, of course, a lot of Jews have left, um, mainly for Germany, uh, some about 15,000 to Israel, um, but more to Germany, some to Poland, other countries. That was an amazing effort in the spring, in the first months of the war. The whole Jewish world really united. And these hundreds and hundreds of buses that took people um, out of the country. A lot of divided families. Again, if the husband is of military age, he's still in Ukraine. <laughs> the wife or the mother or, of, of children, often in Poland or Germany or in Israel. So. Um, there are a lot of divided families. Um, Jews are fighting in the Ukrainian military. Um, this is a funeral of a Jewish soldier. In, in, the, uh, in uniform there is the chief Jewish chaplain of the Ukrainian military. Uh, right after the war started, uh, Rabbi David Milman and there's a Jewish chaplaincy. Um, the other rabbi is the rabbi of Lviv, Rabbi Bald. Uh, Jews are fighting in the military, uh, and that is of great interest. As far as Jewish life, well, in the winter, the hardest problem has been electricity. The Russians have been shelling all the electrical stations, and there are blackouts, emergency blackouts because there's no electricity, and there are planned blackouts. Ukraine doesn't have enough electricity to make it through the winter. Um, so a lot of Jewish life, you know, meetings are by candlelight or by flashlight. The most important thing I took with me to Ukraine was my flashlight because you never know when the electricity will go out. And usually it's for four hours. All right, but you need, it, winter it gets dark early, and you need your flashlight because, but it's quite amazing how people are, are, you know, adjust and even conduct Jewish life, you know, 
without electricity. There's a lot going on by Zoom. Um, courses. I've given lectures here, sitting in my seminary office, for this Jewish studies program in Kiev, um, because the you know large gatherings in Kiev, let's say, are risky. Not in Chernovtsi, but in Kiev, it would be risky to have a large gathering like that. So they they meet by Zoom. Um, as I say, I was in Chernovtsi in the west. A little, a little about my trip directly. Uh, Chernobyl is a delightful city, multi-ethnic city, historically. That is, Jews were once 40% of this city. Jews were once 40% of this, the largest ethnic group. At, um, but it also had Germans, Ukrainians, Romanians, and Poles. Very proud of their multi-ethnic heritage. Yeah, this is my hotel, you know, with a sign, this way to the shelter. Um, the truth is, there was an area alarm when I was in Chernivtsi. You know, the sirens go off. We were, I went with my wife, Elisa Bamporad, who's also a professor of Jewish history like me. And um, we were startled, but the people there were like totally chill about it. Because Chernobyl has never been hit by missiles, most people just ignore the alarms. They went the first five, six, seven, eight, nine times, and when nothing ever happened, now uh, people just go about their business when there's an aerial alarm in this city. Um, though public transportation stops, government offices close, many things change, but you know, cars are on the streets, people are walking on the streets in the middle of an aerial alarm. If, if Chernobyl will get hit by missiles, I'm sure that will change. Um, in the middle of the city, there's a big, big tent for refugees, uh, for internally displaced people um, who can live there, who can eat there. The Jewish community actually has funds to help Jewish refugees better than that. Jewish refugees get apartments, usually by families. Um, they don't have to live in an enormous tent. I ask people, well, what about anti-Semitism? Isn't there, I don't know, jealousy, resentment that Jews get better? He said, uh, the answer I got was, we are such a small drop in the bucket that most people don't even notice that Jewish refugees are getting housed in apartments um, rather than in these kind of big uh, tents. Um, well, well, let me explain. These two things are not evident. This on the left is a big building which has lots of pedestals with great history, great figures from world culture. It's the theater building, and it has, you know, these little statues of people from world culture, except when it came to Pushkin, the Russian writer, they took away the statue of Pushkin. In other words, there's still Shakespeare, and there's still, you know, French writers, and Ger but there's a very anti-Russian feeling, and they took, literally took Pushkin off his pedestal. Um, you can understand the reasons for that feeling. Um, it was hard for me because I speak Russian, but I don't really speak Ukrainian. I can fake a few phrases and things like that, but... Um, there's now a law that in public institutions, they only speak Ukrainian. So I go to the hotel and I talk to the guy. He, he will, I will talk Russian, but he will only answer me in Ukrainian. I don't always understand um, what's being said. You go to a cafe. Now, every once in a while, someone knows English, but that's pretty rare. So um, luckily, again, my wife, Elisa, knows Ukrainian much better than me, and she could speak to people in Ukrainian, which was really a big help. Because, again, in these official and public uh, settings, even in a store, they would talk to me in Russian if, they would, because it's a law, they would if no one was watching. The other picture is, a, there is on the other hand a plaque for a Yiddish writer who lived in Chernovitz, uh, Chernovitsi, Eliezer Steinbark, and there are several Jewish plaques in the city. Um, we spoke at the Aviv Center, which is the Masorti community in um, Chernivtsi. Chernivtsi is really maybe the top hub of 
conservative Judaism, Masorti Judaism in Ukraine, even stronger than, today definitely stronger than Kiev. Um, it's a beautiful community. Um, Friday night dinner, there were about 60 people. And it was very powerful because I understood, I could see. They're not there for the free food. Yes, there are many of those people are displaced people from all over Ukraine. You know, we went around the room, they're from Kharkiv, they're from Odessa, they're from Dnipro, they're from Zaporizhia, they're from Kiev. Of course, yes, this community has grown because of all the influx of, of refugees, but they didn't come for the food. They really, because the food was not that good. Um, there was no meat. Friday night dinner, no chicken, no meat. They came for the fellowship and the, the, and the singing and the, and the community. And I, I really saw, maybe for a rare time in my life, how Judaism is helping people survive. I had never seen that before, that the tefillot and the eating together, this what, which helped them cope. And these people, many of whom probably never went to synagogue Friday night, in their original community, they will always remember that in their hardest moments, Judaism helped them, and this Jewish community helped them. So this was a very powerful experience for me, but all, and I'm sure for, for, for them. The fellow on the right next to me is Yuri Radchenko. He's from Kharkiv originally. Kharkiv has been bombed a lot. So he fled to Chernivtsi. He's a historian of the Holocaust. Um, and he was a convert, and he was circumcised, and he's, he's become one of the true leaders of the community in uh, Chernivtsi. You know, he's very committed to Judaism. Uh, very interesting how a Ukrainian would convert. And, well, he studied the Holocaust, and he identified so strongly with the Jews that he became one. Um, the fellow standing on the left from the audience uh, he's a small business manager uh, in Chernivitz. What's interesting about him, he's one of the supporters of the congregation, person who has enough means to actually donate. Um, his son is in the army and is at the front, is in Bakhmut, which is the city that they've been fighting over for months and probably very soon Ukrainians will have to retreat from Bakhmut. So his son is at Bakhmut. I don't know how he has the strength to uh, just go on with life uh, thinking that his son is uh, in the most dangerous place you can be right now. Uh, then this is the Aviv, uh, uh, this is at, at Havdalah, the girl in the middle. You can a little bit see the, she's carrying, holding the uh, Havdalah candle. Um, oh, this is a curiosity, but I should finish up. Um, this is a former major Hasidic center, Sadeger, and the Hasidim. Sadiger Hasidim in Israel rebuilt the palace and the synagogue of the Rebbe, but there are no Hasidim who live there. So the Hasidim come from Israel, like for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, but most of the other place is empty. So what did they do? They offered the facility for refugees to live there. Not Jewish refugees. They're none of the refugees that are living in this Hasidic center are Jewish. The only requirement is the food on the premises must be kosher their own food. So now you have this Hasidic center um, becoming a refugee center. I'll wrap things up. Um, okay, that's me on TV. I'm going to skip some things. Uh, I'll finish up with telling you about a couple of other of my friends and people I care about who are affected by this war. Uh, this is Alexandra Uralova. She's now a refugee in Berlin. She fled very early in the war. She's the top translator of Yiddish literature into Ukrainian. She translated Shalom Aleichem's Tevye the Dairyman into Ukrainian. And she got a fellowship, and she's still translating to Ukrainian, um, now in Berlin. This is Yuri again. It's a summer picture. He you know, teaches Torah classes in Aviv and in Chernivtsi. Sasha Nazar... Um, lives in Lviv, and he's, he's always been a powerhouse of volunteerism. Um, 
he leads a volunteer center at the local com Jewish community center, repairing old synagogues. That's what's going on on the right. He gets people together to, to repair and all. Now, of course, he's stopped working on synagogues and cemeteries. He's just working on helping the influx of people to Lviv, um, refugees. Um, this is Mikola Hayavoy. Mikola, not Jewish, Ukrainian, worked for the project I run, the Jewish Archival Survey. Um, then I got a letter of resignation in March. He said, I'm leaving your project. I'm going to war. And he's like 25, 26, graduate student in history. And he's still at the front. He's in the artillery. Uh, it's a very different face before and now. And last, it's just so you can know, you know, there are many people at, you know, at night you think, oh, what's happening with him or her? Um, Tatiana Batanova is the head of the Judaica department at the Vernadsky Library. That's basically the Ukrainian National Library. There are a lot of rarities and treasures in Judaica treasures in this library. She's in charge of it. She's never left Kiev. She will never leave Kiev. She's a total patriot. Um, I asked her, what have you done with the treasures to protect them? She said to me, I cannot tell you over the phone. In other words, that's uh, confidential information. We have taken measures to protect the material, but I cannot tell you. OK, so um, that's it. Sorry if it's not very organized, but um, I'd love to, if you have any reactions, um, I'd love to respond or hear, really hear. Uh, Izzy. The majority is Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. There are other denominations in certain regions that are Greek Catholic. Don't, there's a, a whole th Greek Catholic Church, just for your interest, is a compromised church between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. So there are, in certain regions, Greek Catholics, but it's overwhelmingly Orthodox. Anti-Semitism has been on the decline, and I, can, I didn't bring the numbers, but there have been surveys that show it, since 2014. 2014 is a big Walmart date that was when there was a revolution in Ukraine. Um, I'd, I think, I'm not saying, there's no country without anti-Semitism. There's no country without anti-Semitism. But at least now, especially now, you'd be crazy to be an open Ukrainian anti-Semite. You'd be feeding the Russian propaganda that this is a Nazi state. If you are an open anti-Semite, you are helping the Russians. So. There's no open anti-Semitism. I was very impressed. Again, it's very hard to generalize. I often think of people, how are race relations in America? You think they're terrible. They're very complicated. We know there are good aspects. They're worse than before, but it's very hard in one sentence to say what race relations are like in America. And that's when people say, what is anti-Semitism like in Ukraine? I can't get my pay. But let me tell you one thing. In Chernivtsi, I'm very sensitive to these things. How people say the word Jewish and whether they say the word Jewish. Many Ukrainians, Russians too, are uncomfortable even saying the word Jewish. They feel awkward, and oh, I can't go into all the reasons for that. So I listen to how people, non-Jews, say Jewish. The tonality, even in English, you can sometimes, from the tone, say, you know, ah, oh, he's a Jew. You, you don't have, you know. And what I heard in Chernobyl is people are very comfortable with that. I got introduced, you know, professor, I was stunned the way she on TV said, professor of Jewish history at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. I said, wow, she has no problem with that. She didn't mumble it or, you know, professor of Jewish history, you know. <laughs> so, you know, again, this has to be monitored. Okay. I'll take one or two more because Natasha wants to teach, an, uh, and I want to hear another song. Yeah. I'm 
Oh, there are many, you know, there's Razam for Ukraine. There are many charities to give to. There are many, Razam for Ukraine is our favorite. Um, for the Jewish community, of course, the JDC, I think what I would love to see, well, first of all, to give directly to the Aviv Center in Chernovsky. They're doing amazing work. They're supporting Jewish refugees there. Uh, uh, that's a sister community. Why aren't we directly helping a sister com uh, community? If you, have, um, if you have time in the summer, I would love for, and you have, if you have the internal guts, I think a group of rabbinical students should go to Ukraine, to Western Ukraine where I was, where it's safe, relatively safe to help. It's not the other side of the planet, you know, it's doable. But in other words, there are ways, you know, there's, we're probably gonna also enter now a political battle in America with the far right saying we don't, this doesn't matter to us. So there's need for political support, there's need for financial support, and there's need for live people to help. You, you can't imagine how appreciative people will, Jews and even non-Jews, to meet me and my, and my wife. They're not a lot of tourists, right? Our hotel was empty. We were the only guests for the first couple of days. And just to see a live an American Jew, that really mattered to people. Or a live American when it was, you know. Um, the, that, you know, it's not only the, you know, Biden went to Kiev or some, or some movie star went to Ukraine. When, when any one of us goes, we really give them a lot of support. And again, you don't have to go to the battlefield. You can go to a part of the country, it's safe. All right, but those are different thoughts. <laughs> okay, Natasha. continue listening to more more stories but um, just to bring it together a little bit um, in April the group of uh, cantorial students who are singing in the choir we recorded a video of Ukrainian song and it became a part of a larger video uh, which was a fund uh, put together by the Cantor Cantor's assembly uh, which was aired in J June uh, and which was a fundraiser for Masorti Olami. For, for, so in that video, you'll see uh, bits of, uh, you know, Aviv community in Chernivtsi and, and uh, Ruben Stama from Kiev and all those people. And, and there we are, too, helping. And they raised about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000. But like, um, like David said, uh, there is a need for direct support in all kinds of ways, but also education. I just came back uh, last week from... Um, uh, Conference of American Choral uh, Directors. Uh, it's about 10,000 people who were there. It's a national organization. And I and my Jewish colleague from Philadelphia presented two sessions on Ukrainian choral music, uh, which felt like a direct uh, responsibility at this point because we have access to it. We understand how it works. We, 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 we can teach about it. It's not our heritage, but it's something we wanted to share with people. And... Uh, so if you want to, we'll share the, the link to that video again. So people, if people are interested and want to see that, be inspired by it, we, we can. Uh, wanted to close with this beautiful song. You have the words at the back of your... Um, so uh, I just thought it would be, you know, David spoke about uh, the Jewish president of Ukraine. So um, here is a beautiful uh, song that talks about Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. It was written in 1962 by a composer called Ihor Naumovich Shamo. And uh, I'm giving you his patronymic because Naumovich means Ben Nahum. He's a Jewish composer, and he was very, very, very popular in his time. And the beautiful thing was that he wrote this piece, and it was very beloved in 1962. And then uh, since the independence of Ukraine, there were multiple competitions to create an anthem for Kiev, a musical anthem for Kiev. They spend about 100,000 grieven, uh, which is like a ruble, like a, you know, like whatever, their, their, their uh, monetary uh, unit. And uh, after three years, they gave up. 
And then in 2014, right after the big, big uh, Maidan, big uh, uprising on the, on the central square of Kiev, they said, oh, let's go back to this great song written in 1962. And so the song by a Jewish composer became uh, the anthem of Kiev. And I wanted to just show you a little bit. So I have a little Ukrainian here. For those of you who wonder how close Ukrainian and Russian are, uh, they're both Slavic languages. They share roughly about 60% of their vocabulary. It may feel like a lot to you, maybe, but if you think also that English and Dutch share about 60% of their vocabulary, and, and I don't know how your Dutch is, mine is not so good. So um, the, I just want to teach you the last line uh, in Ukrainian, and you have a transliteration there. It says, Yak, say it with me, Yak, Tebe, Tebe, Ne lubiti, Ne lubiti, Yak, Tebe, Ne lubiti. Як тебе не любити, Києве мій, Києве мій. How can I not love you, my Kiev? And um, so I'll sing the melody so you'll hear it. And then, uh, and then you'll know Ukrainian momentarily. Даємо розлений тихий день до гора. Дорогими для мене стали схили Дніпра, де колишуть завіті закоханих мрій, як тебе не любити, Києве мій, де колишуть завіті закоханих мрій. Try it with me in English. Let my city rest dreaming over the waters below. May the peaceful lights gleaming sparkle over the Nipah. 